to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, McGee Dam, and today we're going to be talking about The Magic Mouse Trap, written by Matthew Sweet. Yes, the guy who did all those uh, documentaries for Doctor Who and various other sci fi programs wrote a big Finnish audio drama featuring the Seventh Doctor, Ace, and Hex. Um, I don't know much about the the behind the scenes issues or anything um, or the fans um, genuine opinion general general opinions on this story it seems to be an overlooked adventure um, luckily in terms of me anyway this story doesn't have any heavy reliance on the hex storyline or any sort of storyline in that matter however it does uh, poke a stick at the Cardinal Master Plan, the idea of making a Doctor a darker figure in a way. Um, much later on in the story. Um, although, uh, the first few episodes do something which I think is really unique and puts a nice twist on events, which makes this story a much more enjoyable, enjoyable experience than I think it actually deserves. Um, can't really think of much really to talk about it without giving away spoilers because uh, something happens which is um, very connected to Doctor Who lore in a way but um, it's a bit, a bit of a spoiler so um, I'll go into that in a bit. So anyway this is the official Big Finish CD cover which um, looks very nice there. I like the colour red. Oh there's me in the reflection over there. Try, try and angle it so it doesn't... Wow, I don't know what a matter today. It's really reflecty. Um, I do apologise for that. But anyway, I actually printed out my own DVD cover. And this is one of the few times where I had to make one from scratch. Because I couldn't find anyone that I liked. Um, I basically took the basic image on the cover. And I put this like weird like effect on it. Because I know... I knew this story was um, a weird adventure. And you can kind of see Hex and Ace's faces in the background there, if you can see them. Um, here's the spine, if anyone's interested. I've given it like a dark, shadowy glow um, behind the text to try and make it stand out. Because originally, it was not uh, standing out properly. And this is the back, which is kind of a giveaway that it was me who made this and not um, something I stolen off um, DeviantArt or Christopher Lothith's um, um, channel. So there you go. That's the, the official covers and my fan-made cover, I suppose you can say. So the story is set in Switzerland in 1926 and the doctor finds himself on a carriage um, going up to uh, one of the hills. Um, where he is um, in the same cabin as a woman, um, Queenie Glasscock, I believe her name was. Um, yeah, Queenie Glasscock. Don't laugh, it's a genuine name. And right off the bat, the doctor seems to be suffering from amnesia. He has no memory of... He has, no, he has basically no memory of what he is. He... He's like, I think I'm the Doctor. I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Um, and he basically is like, right, I'm going to go to this, uh, up to the the building which we're going to, which turns out to be a hospital, and just act like he owns the place and knows what he's on about to try and foil his enemies because he doesn't know what he's getting himself into. And whilst we're at the hospital, we get introduced to a bunch of of characters um, and each of them have a kind of game uh, feel to them. Each of them are playing with these uh, games, um, if it's like wordplay games or like quiz games and stuff like that. Um, one character plays a word game uh, deriving from letters. I feel like, I can't remember what it's called, it's like Uno? Not Uno, uh, Uno is the card game. Um, Oh, what's the word game? Like a crossword puzzle. I can't remember what they're called. Um, and one character actually comes up with the word TARDIS. 
Now, the interesting fact about episode one, which is actually a uh, really nice contrast to uh, The Harvest, the first story with Hex, is unlike that story where the Doctor doesn't appear in the first episode, in this story, the Doctor's the only uh, main character to appear, uh, which is a very strange to hear Sylvester McCoy on his own. It won't be the only time we'll be hearing Sylvester McCoy on his own, but um, personally, I've never experienced a story by himself, so this is a very interesting experience. And right off the bat, this story is one of those weird stories. It's one of those ones where, like, um, I'm trying to think of three great examples. is Ghost Light, The Celestial Toy Room, and The Mind Robber, where this weird-ass stuff just sort of happens. Um, uh, the Doctor slowly, I guess, kind of becomes a patient. Uh, one scene he gets, um, he's trying to figure out what's going on, and this character puts um, a cloth over the Doctor's face, <laughs> and the Doctor kind of pushes his head, Do you know your cloth tastes, uh, smells like chlorophyll? Uh, does it? Hmm. And then knocks the doctor out. And when the doctor wakes up, he's in his question mark pyjamas and is running around um, the building trying to look up something in the basement as he keeps hearing information about characters in the basement that seem to be controlling everything. Very strange and very bizarre. Now, the rest of the, this story is very hard to talk about because... Um, uh, there's a lot of spoilers. If you're interested in listening to this story, it's a pretty decent story. I say I highly recommend it if you like your weird ass adventures, but it heavily relies on you going in not knowing what's going on. Um, because episode two um, basically plays on stuff that's interested in part one and goes full depth into this. Essentially, the cliffhanger for part one, uh, the Doctor finds the room in which Ace and Hex are. But when Ace and Hex encounter the Doctor, they put on silly voices and pretend not to know the Doctor. What is going on? And in part two, we basically see the Doctor basically being mapped out. Um, Many characters have stated throughout the story that um, this isn't the first time the Doctor's been here. Um, this is something that's been repeated into, into it. Like, um, the Doctor goes in, he investigates, they wipe his memory and set him back into part one. Uh, one character actually has a sort of fit. And, uh, like, the leader character, I believe his name is like Locus, uh, Locivus. Um, he gives him um, shock therapy, and the doctor is like, "No, this isn't mad. This isn't insane. I'm gonna," and he starts uh, breaking up machinery to try and stop the shock therapy. And he's all these other characters is like, "You don't know what you've done. Um, you've caused so much trouble. Uh, don't get involved anymore." And the doctor's like, um, "Oh, I haven't even started yet." Somebody better tell me what's going on, or I'm going to get really mad and I'm going to destroy more stuff. And whilst this is all going on, Ace and Hex are watching the Doctor's actions on monitors. Um, basically, um, playing him, using him as a kind of chess piece. Basically, with the roles of um, the Doctor being this manipulative chess master, the roles are now reversed. Now it's Ace and Hex's turn to play the Doctor. And what I really love about this is that Ace and Hex have completely different emotional responses to playing this role. Hex is actually really disgusted by this and hates the fact that he has to manipulate the Doctor for um, various of reasons. And he actually compares the Doctor to one of them, to an old patient that would have that would turn up lost and helpless in one of his A and E um, in his hospital where he used to work, but Ace doesn't seem to be that distressed. As she explains, the Doctor has more multiple occasions 
manipulated and twisted um, her and very other friends to get what he wants to get the best victory he can possibly can. And Ace is kind of like, right, it's now it's my turn to manipulate him and um, and basically play him as the fool in a sense. Um, there's a great scene in which when X basically gets emotional and Ace just tells him to stop. Um, don't get emotional, it'll get harder if you get attached. Just, you know, this is just another day in our adventures. Just relax. Everything's going to be okay. okay. Um, do not uh, threat, do not thrive. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting dynamic and it luckily plays a big key part in episodes uh, two and three as the Doctor slowly starts learning more. We also get a lot of great weird scenes. Uh, the Doctor and uh, Queenie are investigating this hospital after the Doctor orders them to a doctor, not the doctor, a doctor in the hospital orders the doctor, our doctor, to start running around in a very uh, silly scene in which he's like running around the castle and he's like, um, um, I always find running boring. Well, um, um, when you're running to something, you're running from something, that's okay. But running around in circles, that's just absolutely insane. Just stuff like that. Um, uh, the typical kind of dialogue that we're familiar with, with the sixth doc the seventh Doctor in the audio and TV adventures. And we get another great moment of weird scenes where he accidentally like, stabs on piles where, uh, tiles um, that have words on them. Uh, one of them says, um, an avalanche comes and attack you, move back two steps. An avalanche suddenly um, comes into actually the corridors as they're running away. And the doctor actually notices if he runs away from Queenie, the, uh, the avalanche actually follows the doctor. And, um, and he's kind of looking for more words on tiles. And he clicks onto one of them, which it says, like, um, you find a surfboard, uh, move forward two steps. So basically they're playing a giant game of snake and ladders in a sense, a much more complicated, complex version. And there's this whole theme with um, with games and this whole theme of um, manipulation, which is right up the seventh Doctor's alley. Matthew Sweet really knows how to write not only a seventh Doctor story, but a story that would fit easily in his era. It's both weird, campy and um, theatrical, but it's also in depth. It's also um, got a lot to talk about, and it also has the Doctor, um, or at least uh, the plot line, has someone manipulating people. Uh, even though in this case, now the roles are sort of reversed, as far as we know. Um, um, so Ace and Hex basically try to keep the Doctor in you as possible um, for a particular time limit and then when the time limit is over they can basically reveal everything to the Doctor. But the Doctor and Queenie actually escape from the building and get their memories restored um, or at least to uh, a segment of it and the Doctor basically now starts to remember Ace and Hex um, it's like, I'm going back for my friends, where they are going to apologise. Um, so he tries to get to uh, the same room as him, and he meets all of these weird, quirky characters. I think some of the characters, uh, side characters, are a bit too weird and quirky, in a sense that they're not really characters. They're just weird people who just so happen to be appearing in the story and have a weird like gimmick with these games. Um, but anyway, uh, the cliffhanger for part two is where the real threat is revealed. The Doctor walks into a room after Lotus um, tells the Doctor, where you do, don't go in this room, this is the most important thing. You cannot go in this room. 
This is the most dangerous, most thing, and I can't tell you why, but you cannot go in. And the doctor doesn't listen to him. He opens the door, and he finds a doll. A doll dressed up in a, uh, in a very familiar clothing. And the doctor couldn't believe it. He's like, I'm not quite sure. I don't understand. Is it you? Is it the celestial toy maker? As the, uh, the doll starts speaking, got a gear, doctor, got a gear. And that's the cliffhanger. The revelation that this story is actually uh, a celestial toy maker story. Now, an important note. Uh, this was actually Big Finish's first story they did with the Celestial Toy Maker. This was actually released in release order before um, the Nightmare Fair. The story, the last story that we've tackled that deals with the Celestial Toy Maker. And in a way, they, the two stories still kind of connect. They still kind of work. In that story, it ends with the Celestial Toy Maker being banished to his own um, paradoxical prison, his own paradoxical dimension. Um, and in here, we never actually see a actual form of the Toy Maker, though we do hear about it. In this story, we, he only takes the form of a doll, um, and. We slowly and surely get to learn more about what's been happening and what's been going on as the toy maker escapes and starts trying to manipulate all these characters to play these games. Um, and if he wins, um, not only do the rest of the characters die, but he also gains a little bit more of his power. Um, and essentially what's been happening is this. Um, the toy maker... Um, Obviously, he has been playing games with people, kidnapping people from our reality into the celestial toy room, his dimension, and been playing games with them. And whenever they lose, um, when he gets bored of them, they get turned into dolls. However, once in his life, he got bored and wanted to know what it felt like to lose. And so he lost a particular game on purpose, and he got himself turned into a doll and had parts of his memory erased. But whilst this happened, everybody who defeated him, a group of humans um, who defeated him, um, had a little bit of their energy, a little bit of their of his power granted to them, which is allowed which is how, how so many characters in this story have weird and bizarre abilities. Uh, but the doctor's shock, he doesn't understand. How can a group of humans, even if there's like thousands of humans, how can any group of humans defeat the celestial toy maker at his own game? This should be a theoretically impossible ability. What's going on? And the, the humans, I believe it was either Hex or Locus, explain that um, uh, um, Basically, after the, 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 the game was lost and the Celestial Toy Maker lost, um, the champion uh, set up this trap on Earth in Switzerland to which have people keep forgetting that they're even playing the game and slowly and surely uh, the Toy Maker's abilities, his powers, will lose and slowly and surely, after a moment in time, he will fade away and cease to exist. And this plan was the Doctor. He was the one who defeated the Celestial Toy Maker, and he was the one who actually told Ace and Hex and everybody to basically erase his memory and put everything back to normal until the Toy Maker is destroyed. So, in a way, the Doctor, um, uh, after all of this adventure, is still the manipulative one. However, in this case, he manipulated himself, and because the Doctor isn't used to being the one to be manipulated, he actually um, defeated himself in that um, he wasn't supposed to learn about the Celestial Toy Maker's existence in this adventure, uh, which granted the Celestial Toy Maker his powers, his stronger abilities, 
Um, and, and so the manipulative games keep continuing as um, more games and more strategy is turned out as the Doctor's trying to figure out um, how to get his TARDIS back, how to defeat the toy maker now that he's got his memory back and how, how to stop the Celestial Toy Maker. Um, um, and it's a really great theme of manipulative manipulation and um, just playing around with human personality in this story. Something which was an element, it's always been an element in a way of Seventh Doctor stories, but here it's one of the main themes of his adventure. So uh, I would even consider this might even be like one of the necessary listens if you want to get into Seventh Doctor adventures. It's a very, it's one of those stories that really puts what people like about the Seventh Doctor right into the forefront of the adventure. Um, essentially, the toy maker puts all of the uh, people inside the building against against each other, um, and he's trying to like gain uh, each other abilities by making them basically kill each other in these games. In one of them, there's a quiz game in which he threatens people with uh, bolts of electricity, and he asks one person, "How much voltage do you think I have?" And then he asks everybody else, um, "Would it be higher or lower than what they?" Than what they'd say. Obviously the games are kind of rigged to the point where the toy maker cannot lose and the the final test is actually a chess game between Queenie and her father who is a huge fan of the game chess and is basically going to win anyway. Um, but the toy maker is adamant that um, that they play the game to the bitter end. Now, like I said, each character has the semi-ability of the toy maker, and the way they defeat him in this story is that basically this chess piece is made in a way that each time they made a turn, uh, the electrical voltage basically gets stronger and stronger. I wonder if in a way, um, this came out in 2009, so that was before the Matt Smith era. In a Matt Smith story, I believe it's The Wedding of River of Song, um, they actually play a game of chess uh, where people get electrocuted. So I wonder if it's like the same cosmic game in a sense, just now it's here. And this character, um, basically he pushed himself into the celestial toy room and what he's done is he's asked his daughter to actually heighten the voltage so that the next move will kill him. And what this does is it traps him and the Celestial Toy Maker in a game which cannot end. Otherwise, this character dies and because he's connected in a sense to the Celestial Toy Maker, it would also technically kill or at least harm the Celestial Toy Maker in a very dangerous way trapping him and the doctor then returns um, basically the the situation the surrounding Switzerland um, turns back into a normal hospital um, as Ace and Hex and the doctor are talking like well done we've we saved the day and the doctor walks in it's like um, um, the patients uh, need some rest they need to quiet down uh, so you don't mind like waiting around in another room as uh, Queenie actually is in shock, she's in tears, she's, um, she's mortified by losing uh, her father. Um, and there you go, that's the magic mouse trap. Um, I kind of skipped over a lot of details because there's a lot of just scenes that play for, like, in a way, weird sakes. Like, scenes are only there just to be like, whoa, this story's weird. Like, I didn't even mention the... Uh, the theatre production to distract um, the Doctor from trying to get into the clues and stuff. Um, but overall, this story um, has a lot of elements um, that I'm particularly fond of. It seems like a story that was made for me. 
It's weird as hell. It's strange. It has a um, fun recurring villain uh, back into the series. And it shows not only the Doctor at his most manipulative, manipulating even himself, but we also get to see the tables turn as Ace and Hex are basically controlling the situation as the Doctor is the pawn in the game. Which really is a, such an interesting dynamic that I would say... Go listen to it if you're a, if you're a, if you're an any fan of the Seventh Doctor specifically. I say I highly recommend it. It's not amazing, however. Some scenes do seem weird for the sakes of weird. Like I stated before, this kind of stuff I really it really is like my interests. But I will admit it is a lot of scenes are weird for the sakes of being weird, um, and. The pacing could have been a lot better in part four. But a great setup, a great characters in our main in our main four, a main five I should say, because Queenie was a great character as well. And uh, we had a great villain and we had the great three main characters. So yeah, not much to say apart from go check it out. It's a really enjoyable story. So join me next time where we will have a, um, a very rare pure historical story as Doctor Ace and Hex getting caught up in a in a war of time. In a particular war in time, not a war of time. So join me next time for I believe it's pronounced the Angle of Chardist, but I'm not quite sure. I think I'm mispronouncing that. So join me next time for that story. I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!